yesterday in the US. It's a record number of uh, people. It's like an entire World Trade Center attack uh, in each day. Um, over 100,000 hospitalizations. And um, as, as some pointed out, it might be the long history of the United States. These coming months are the toughest ones um, ever on, on record. So this is really, these are unprecedented times and, uh, and the hardest and the most dangerous. Uh, so we made it so far, but I hope we all will stay safe. It's been devastating to the theater community, the musicians, poets, dancers. It's uh, Already it was uh, so hard to carve out a living, to create space for what we think is so important, the imagination, the space uh, um, for the symbolic, and but also for the real, to be part of change, but also to remind us that uh, there's more to life uh, than what the eye meets and, uh, and what are the true uh, values and the essence of it. Even so now we've been reminded we are not um, essential workers and uh, of course we think we aren't because we miss it so much I think so many of us realize how important it is so we listen to the voices of uh, theater artists since March uh, uh, globally it's the perhaps the only uh, recording archive of a profession in globally in this uh, p pandemic and in September we started again and opened our uh, our view we in the idea of a Joseph Boyce of an enlarged uh, um, understanding of the art in the enlarged understanding of theater and performance. We include curators, uh, producers, critics, also in a way they are artists, they collage, they observe, they put things together, they create meaning, they edit. And, um, and one of the voices uh, in New York City that is uh, in our uh, mind uh, and experience important uh, that we have followed and also collaborated with um, is uh, uh, Helen Shaw. Uh, she is a theater critic and uh, has observed for, for many, uh, many years, decades, uh, uh, this scene. She uh, works now for the great New York magazine and Vulture, where she can find her, her work, her observations, her uh, notations. Uh, uh, some people, I think of critics like dance notation, when people say, what's happening on stage? And then you try to, the symbols and words, to figure it out. And uh, so you can go back uh, what it really was and in 50 or 100 or 200 years it will be her writing where people say, oh, this was this all about at that time. She uh, before was at the Time Out New York and uh, Four Columns, and she wrote for Art Forum, American Theatre, The Guardian, Art in America, New York Times, the uh, Theatre Forum, many, many others. She is an instructor at NYU, the Tisch School of Drama, and she comes out of uh, Harvard University and has an MFA from the great, uh, at that time at least, also a great ART uh, a theater under Brustein, I guess, and the Moscow Art Theater Institute for Advanced Theater Training at um, Harvard. This was uh, before uh, the TDM now, uh, which we think highly of the initiative that's coming out of Harvard. That's not really connected to the ART, but shows signs of life. We um, also look at so um, Helen, you are our first, uh, what we say, theater critic, and in, uh, in all of it, it's an important field. Uh, um, so welcome. Where are you? Normally I say, where are you? What time is it? But my guess is... Uh, I'm in Brooklyn. You can see Brooklyn. the a little hint of sunlight from behind me. I'm here in Brooklyn. Yeah. So Helen, uh, what's going on? What are you doing these days? Well, um, coverage in a, a pandemic is, uh, is a strange thing. Um, it is... Uh, looking for things out past the boundaries of what I normally look for. Uh, one of the great things about being a theater critic has always been, in fact, that you don't have to pay attention to everything in the culture at once. You have this very narrow band of work that you want to pay attention to. And uh, pandemic creation has blurred a lot of those boundaries, has sort of exploded a bunch of those silos. And so it's actually just been um, a glut of trying to watch and understand uh, you know, things that are happening in all sorts of corners that now seem theatrical to me in gaming, in all kinds of live performance, in music, um, in film. And uh, so it has been, it has been, um, it has been exciting, partially because it's always exciting to kind of go into realms where you are brand new. Um, and so that has been has been very instructive. And then of course, trying to write about what's actually happening. Um, 
one of the other big changes in a pandemic is a theater critic turns into a theater reporter as almost all of us have. And so old bright lines between critics and makers have been kind of dimming. Uh, and now um, I see my job as, as being one which is more like journalism than art criticism. Uh, and, and maybe that will go back the, to normalcy after this is all over. But for right now, that, that's what I'm up to. Hmm. So it's almost like a little war journalism at the front line. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you you seem you feel it's closer to journalism. So what what are your observations? What are you what are you detecting? Well, one thing that is um, something which you always sort of suspect, but but it's nice to see it um, actually happening in the world, actually borne out, is that. Uh, my interest, my personal interest in theater has almost always been in smaller productions, in smaller organizations, yeah. more exper experimental, but also, uh, you know, pieces that are a little bit more woven into their communities or uh, made by people who are actually working seven jobs at once and are getting paid in Metro cards. And uh, my love of that form has has often been because I see it as very resilient. And right now, that is definitely what we are seeing. We are seeing so much more mobility and innovation and activity from our smallest, smallest producers. And that has been, I think, I hope, a real lesson to the larger sectors, to the more commercial parts of our of our ecology that um, there is a real protection in being small there's protection in being um, in staying in constant contact with your artists and uh, when you look at the different and wildly different ways that these small producers have stayed in contact with their artists so in the case of ps 122 they raised money to house them in the case of uh, soho rep they're putting them on staff in the case of um, Ars Nova, they are putting out almost as much work as they were before. And so there is this um, innovation and excitement. Uh, and again, as I say, at, these, at, the, at the kind of quantum foam level of, of the theater ecology. And, and I think that's, for me, that has been inspiring to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, reminds me of our talk with Sebastian Kaiser from the Volksbühne Berlin, who said uh, after the collapse of, of the Soviet Union theaters, the big theaters were empty uh, for a long time. There were even flea markets, but the small theaters were alive. And it is shocking to think that the billion dollar industry of the New York commercial theater, it, the th places are closed. They're not used, they're not even given to companies. They don't produce masks, they don't deliver food. They don't, you know, uh, as we, far as we know, are not as strongly engaged in supporting the artists. What do you make of that? What does it mean for New York City? Well, I'm afraid that, though, you know, there is not, um, I'm enough of a cynic that I'm not sure that we are uh, seeing a sea change in that. I don't necessarily think that in six months we will see a kind of a great conversion on the part of um, commercial theater in New York uh, towards being more like these uh, smaller, more community invested, more artist invested, uh, you know, nonprofit formats. I, I, I don't believe that for a second. What I do think is going to happen is that it is going to strengthen those small theaters, that they will have um, more strings to their bow. Uh, for instance, we know that all across the country, uh, small theaters, small producers are becoming more involved in government advocacy and lobbying in having their senator on speed dial. And as opposed to sitting back and letting umbrella organizations or letting the sort of marquee names take the lead on that kind of thing. And so I think that strengthening is, is, is hopefully something that will stay with us. Uh, because as we know in this country, the sort of the, the awful draining away of uh, state support which was never that strong to begin with, uh, can only be countered by vigorous citizen 
artist advocacy. And, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, that is, I, I don't want to talk about silver linings, because as you say, thousands of people are dying every day. Um, that's something that blacks out the sun. There's no room for silver lining with that. But when I look at what next year might look like and the years after that, I think that you will see, um, as I would say, more fully integrated uh, production um, ethic, which is uh, that if a theater like Silver Rep, for instance, is now has had a chance to, to sit back and to think, what is our mission? Uh, how is it that we serve artists? And how can we be uh, more sustainable going forward? And, and that, that strength, I think, I hope, will be the thing that survives this apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an that interesting one. that not only uh, what we are doing is important, but how do we do it? How do we produce? How do we connect? How do we you know, treat our own communities of artists or people? Of, yeah, that that perhaps it will be um, become more and more important as as it uh, as it should. Do you think um, there will be um, something like the golden, you know, the twenties, like which also was after an academic that there was an outburst of energy after an acad after the pandemic uh, of. Um, what then was referred to the Spanish flu, even so we know it came from North America, actually, from, I think, so to pig farms that mixed European swines with American ones, and it created a virus that became so deadly. Um, do you think there will be a resurgent? Jay uh, from the Skirball said, Jay Wegman, nothing will happen before the fall. Most probably there will be no productions, no big productions in New York City, so we will have to wait till next year, October, September, October, November, to see anything. What do you see? What do you? What are you? What does your instinct tell you? Well, one thing that this has obviously been doing is it has been radically reshaping what we understand as size. So when we say a big production, what we have normally meant is a expensive production in a large house with a big audience that sells a lot of tickets. Um, and now I think that we, because so much of performance is online, is available online, we're now talking about bigness as, as reach. So if thousands of people see your show, uh, even if it is, for instance, one of my favorite shows of the lockdown, which was Celine Song's uh, version of The Seagull, which he staged in a video game in The Sims, she had thousands of people uh, have watched it, thousands. And that is a big production. It's a, it has reach, people all over the world have seen it. It is going to change the form, it's changing the conversation. That's a big production. And it doesn't actually need to wait for a vaccine. So what's big and what's small is also something I think that's changing. Um, and will there be a, a sort of a, a, an explosion of, of creativity and so forth? Well, it's difficult because, uh, you know, I feel as though I've already lived through a golden age in the theater. Um, we've had two uh, since I've been in New York. One, which was the golden age of uh, company production. So when I came in uh, 2002, this was when we were having it seemed everywhere you looked, you were looking at uh, Dan Safer's small company. Uh, you were looking at uh, the Debate Society. You were looking at the Young Jean Lee Theater Company. You were there was this explosion in small group production. The team, Rachel Chapkins, the team. And that these groups were, uh, the output was incredibly high. They were often doing a show a year, two shows a year. And there was this, there was this very thrilling ferment uh, downtown. Now uh, that has become less possible. As New York has become less livable, it's harder to put together an ensemble who can be in New York all of the time because no one can really afford to live here. So then what happened is we had a second boom, shockingly, is we had a second golden age of playwrights. We had um, Annie Baker, Brenda Jacobs Jenkins. Uh, we've, I mean, think of the playwrights that we, we have right now. We are so Lucky, Will Eno, uh, Jackie Sibley's Drury, these are major writers. And when you read theater history, you think usually you get like a Tennessee Williams and then you have to wait for a while. I mean, we were just, you could not swing a cat in this town without hitting a world changing writer. So will we have that on the other side? Uh, I think we will have the third golden age. I think uh, golden ages are, you know, devalued. Um, but uh, 
I don't think it will be either of those things, probably. Um, my, I, I don't know. I, I, obviously, it's impo impossible to predict. But my, my hope is that we will take these lessons of digital production and we will see a, a, a kind of a swelling of this digital media, digital theatrical um, innovation continuing that spurred by the crisis. But once the crisis lifts and the depression that is, is, is destroying all of us, at least maybe I'm speaking only for myself, uh, hopefully that, you know, that, that match has already been struck. And then when oxygen runs back into the room and we can actually be together, I think it will just roar across the form. We might have a roaring 20s um, again um, in some way. Yeah, I, I think there is um, a lot of it might be true. And also, I mean, it's the first time I've ever seen big flags, apartments for rent, space for rent. Uh, I, when I walk through the streets of New York, people are moving out, offices are moving out, gigantic garbage trucks take you know, beautiful office furniture and throws it away. Uh, people um, in their minivans uh, packing up and leaving, lots of artists are leaving. So um, I think the city is changing. Midtown, every second store really almost is closed, barricaded, out of business. Um, and that often that like in Berlin, it was, you know, after the opening of the wall, these were times where things were happening. So uh, the question is, you know, when, when will there be, in, in what form will it take? You said uh, uh, the lessons we learned in the digital time let's say you know um, we, we often say here like Bertolt Brecht wrote for the children of the technological age but now maybe we do see the performance for the children of the digital age children who grew up with a digital device in their hands of something very very different hmm. and they are hitting the universities kids who grew up with screens so um, what are the lessons what do you when you say I this will continue what 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 do you see what are those lessons what is exciting or what do you felt is a real innovation um, well, I think, first of all, I think there's going to be a kind of authorial decentralization, which, which reminds me a little bit of that, uh, of that boom in devised theater that I was talking about um, in the mm -hmm. 2000s and late 1990s, which is that after, you know, we, we work in waves. So after this gorgeous wave of, of um, well, we're not after it. These are all writers who are still writing. But, but as that, as the wave of sort of uh, powerful, clear individual voices uh, rolls back slightly, I think what we're going to find is decentralized authorship, authorship which has been made possible by uh, digital collaboration. Uh, I know I harp on about this seagull production, but it was really exciting to be working on this seagull with Celine's song because there was, of course, this parallel column while her work was being streamed of the chat. And so everyone in the chat was chiming in and asking her to do certain things and making jokes and uh, su suggesting lines. And because she is a very confident playwright, she actually was able to uh, very casually, very confidently incorporate all of that input into something which was still a shaped evening. So I think that, I think one thing uh, we will see is this, is this kind of ease with audience as co-creator. The second thing uh, is that we understand things about attention now that we did not know before. Uh, and we have, I have, uh, it has become very difficult for me during the pandemic to read, um, which, and I, I don't know if this is a symptom of, of uh, this kind of awful malaise, this depression, isolation, uh, but that my, the way that my attention functions is now, is now quite radically different from what it was like in February. And I think that in a lot of ways, though, it's an acceleration of the digital attention span, that neurologically, uh, the amount of time we spend in screens, the amount of time that we're sort of seeding our uh, private mind to the public space of the internet um, has meant that we are really changing. And so for those of us who are not digital natives, I'm not a digital native, I'm in my 40s, um, we're, we are, we're starting to kind of put our foot in the water of what it is like to be truly online, to truly have an online mind. And that, I think, that kind of understanding how attention has to be marshaled in a noisy mind is something that I have seen the most successful digital production 
musicians do. Uh, sometimes they do that by multiplying the number of channels that you have to interact with the show on. Uh, so Circle Jerk, which I've written about a ton, perhaps too much. Um, I, uh, managed... last year. It's, I it's loved it. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that was exciting about it was that you were simultaneously experiencing this overwhelming amount of dialogue that was happening on the screen. It was very, very, very quick. Um, but at the same time, you were often uh, interacting with it on Twitter uh, at the same time, which was creating its own, again, kind of paratheatrical experience. And so I think we that, that's a lesson that we have learned, the amount that we have to control people's attention and that we are now dealing with brains that function very differently from the brains that say Ibsen's theater was made for. So I, I, I actually think that we have new aesthetic strategies. We have new, uh, uh, we have new dramaturgy, dramaturgical uh, levers that artists are using in order to exploit and enjoy the digital as opposed to simply kind of tipping the hat to it, which I think is what we have done in the past. Mm -hmm. well, what are other examples? The seagull you mentioned, uh, circle jerk, what, what, what have you seen? I mean, it's now uh, almost six months or, or more. And for someone like you, who most probably more or less went every night to the theater. And um, so what did you see online where you say, that was interesting? So, um, when it comes to, uh, I, again, every time something makes me pay attention, I pay attention. So, because I feel so scattered. One thing that I've noticed is um, radical intimacy. So uh, there are productions which are devised for one performer and one audience member, uh, either on the telephone or in a Zoom call in which we have this one-on-one -on -one experience. And of course we know of Christine Jones's uh, experiments that she has been making in New York where she would build these small theaters that you would go into and again, have a one-on-one -on -one experience with people. That was, I don't mean to diminish this in any way because I think that that theater for one is very is was very interesting when it was physically manifest, but it was also a a a folly. I mean, it was in the same way that you know, like a like a little stone pan pantheon in your garden is a folly. That it was it was charming and interesting, but it didn't um, it, it it wasn't a place of worship. Whereas you have a uh, theater for one going online and suddenly again, the reach, this, the reach turns into something that we could not have imagined before. And so there's no longer, um, you still have that terrifying sensation of, of meeting the eyes of the performer through the screen, uh, but now you can be doing this without having to uh, be one of the 15 people who can leave work and, and go to Times Square and walk into one of these little boxes. Uh, other things that I've seen that have been interesting, um, I like very much uh, what's been happening in the world of audio uh, drama. There are some things which I will not mention by name, but I think are kind of retro ideas of audio drama. They are plays done as radio plays and not a lot of adjustment has been made and I, I think they're pretty thin. But things which have been born in audio uh, out of sort of minds that were beginning to think about audio in an actually generative and exciting way, I think have been quite exciting. Uh, Heather Christian, who else? Um, there's a wonderful website called Category Other, uh, which is run by Ben Williams, who has been a sound designer and performer in New York for many, many years. Uh, and he curates a spectacular series of audio works which are feel extremely dramatic, uh, because they, uh, I, I can't actually generalize because all the objects on category other are really, really different from, from uh, one another. But they are things that use uh, that space between your ears <laughs> that your binaural headphones create uh, in a genuinely dramatic way. They build a little stage there. Um, I've also, you know, as always, site-specific work has, um, you know, is beautiful and uh, always has its own glamour, which the pandemic has 
increased. Uh, you know, I've seen many shows at this point in the Greenwood Cemetery and because it's one of the few places that is both private and public, that is both uh, beautiful but calm. Um, and it has been, uh, every time that I've seen something there, it has been completely overwhelming, um, partially just because the audience includes the dead. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that, I will say, so I teach this class uh, and we recently were thinking about a play by Brenda Jacobs Jenkins called Everybody. And Everybody is a play which is a modern sort of riff on every man. And it has essentially the same plot, which is that every man finds out he's going to die. He's told he can bring one person with him to this judgment, to death. And he looks throughout his, his world and he finds that nothing will go with him. Kinship will not go with him. Uh, friendship will not go with him. Uh, good works, nothing will go with him uh, at the edge of the grave. And uh, for those who know the conditions in which Jacobs Jenkins wrote that play, uh, it, was, it was stimulated by the actual impending death of Jim Houghton, the artistic director of Signature Theater, who asked the theater makers at Signature when he was uh, when he knew that he was dying shortly, he asked them to write plays about death because he felt that artists were the people who could imagine beyond the, the born past which no travel returns. And so he said, please show me what is going to happen. Please write about death. And well, Eno wrote him a play and Brandon Jacobs Jenkins wrote him a play. And I think now, and uh, well, Eno's play from that series is Wakey Wakey. And in both cases, these are very, very beautiful plays. And we have suddenly had this kind of parallel commissioning from the universe, which was looking to artists and saying, write about death. We are experiencing a period of mass death. Um, we are experiencing a period of, uh, of you know, for anyone who is in New York in March and April, the constant sound of sirens, that, that it is it's death uh, around you all of the time, uh, driving past your door. And that, that my hope is that playwrights, artists, makers uh, will, he will hear that uh, in the same way that Jacobs Jenkins heard Jim Houghton and, and write something that helps us understand um, what it means to be journeying and so close to death all of the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite a, quite a significant uh, comment. I mean, the sound of the sirens is taking up. I think in New York, we hear them more, you know, uh, it's really, and there's, it is actually going back and uh, we can feel that. Uh, Jan Kott, the great Polish theater critic said, you know, theater always has been that thin line between the living and the dead. You know, someone living represents a dead person, Julius Caesar. You know, or someone dies on stage, but he's of course alive. He pretends to be dead, and so it's always dealt uh, um, with that question we have mentioned here. To Heiner Müller said uh, the German playwright, the great. Everybody thinks it's about the live audience. You know that what creates the liveness. He said actually, what's important is that the audience member could die. It could be the last thing he or she sees. You know that put the potential death. Of the audience, members. so what you do with the meaning of what you show is of um, is of um, significance. Um, mm. So, um, so, so, um, yeah. This is uh, uh, quite quite a time to um, to be. Do you feel that your toolbox, uh, let's say before the pandemic, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years. I don't know how long you 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 worked in your profession, uh, also paid. You know, which is rare in New York City. Um, is your toolbox equipped to deal with these online screens or is it a classical music concert critic all of a sudden is going to a rock concert and say, I don't know what, they have different instruments, they don't wear, you know, an outfit that I know what, this is terrible, or the other <laughs> way around, you know, so, so what about, how does that work if you had to adjust? Well, um, this is a strange thing to admit in public, but um, 
one of the great infusing, um, energizing uh, components of this work is that you are constantly appearing in front of or, or sitting at uh, shows that you are not qualified to write about. And either it is written out of an experience that you do not share, uh, assumes a cultural literacy do you, that you do not have. Um, and I cannot count the number of times that I've been sitting in an audience knowing that I was going to write about something and thought, I'm not qualified to do this. Uh, I recently, um, you know, joined New York Magazine. And uh, for the 15 years before that, I was writing, as you said, for four columns and for Time Out. And my work there was very much uh, at Time Out. I was the third string critic. Um, I was writing about, uh, generally writing about either small or weird productions, <laughs> sometimes larger, but almost always weird. Uh, at four columns, uh, I did begin to write long form pieces about, uh, about Broadway, but it was a pretty recent development in my, in my work. So when I came to uh, New York Magazine, I again was sitting in audiences where I was looking at the stage thinking, I'm not qualified to cover this. And the, um, the, the answer that I have had in the past every time is, um, well, you know, qualifications are something that you, that you speak about when you're talking about a job. And criticism, despite the fact that I am paid for it, is not a job. It is, a, it is an action and a task and a calling. And so, it doesn't matter if I'm qualified, it just matters that I'm honest and work hard. And so in each of those cases, trying to write about something that I am not qualified to write about has taught me so much um, about the form and about expanding, and this to me is the most important thing, is expanding the types of pleasure that I take in work, that I take in art. And I think that as a writer, as a critic, I think that that is, that's the task, is charting for people, um, charting for readers, uh, how you are finding pleasure in what you are watching and how much you want them to share that pleasure as well. So watching this online work, um, as I say, as I said at the beginning, you know, it used to be that if you were a theater critic, you didn't, you, you had a lot of you lived through a lot of FOMO because you couldn't get to every show in New York, but at least I didn't mind if I was missing a movie. I mean, I, I still felt that I was literate in my own field. Um, and now that the field has expanded to include basically anything that can happen in front of your eyes, uh, it is, uh, you know, that I have the sense of scrambling to catch up, constantly, constantly scrambling, um, you know, and occasionally my techniques in figuring out how to catch up include embarrassing things like asking my students to say, saying, what's the most important thing you saw on YouTube? You know, just fr again, frantically trying to kind of um, gain this cultural literacy. And uh, so the toolkit that you bring to it, I think, I hope that all critics have is, um, is curiosity. And I am, I am curious. So I, and I am happy to write about that curiosity and to share that curiosity. Uh, that's, and that's where I've had to leave it. I, I think that I don't have imposter syndrome. Um, I think that I have um, a, a frank understanding of how little I know, but mm. I'm comfortable with that. Mm. Or perhaps uh, in the Jungian sense, Jung, Carl Jung always would say, we've met the patient, if we can compare it with the stage product, it had to be a white, you could not use anything what you used before because it would not be right for for um, what he's experiencing now. Actually, you had to forget everything. I think why, why your writing also is so good and absolutely, I think you also have that ability to look at it uh, um, at the moment and, um, <clears throat> and also fast to make up your mind. Often we may <laughs> joke and say, this is Helen Shaw, the stand-up critic. <laughs> and because you could do it uh, so fast and so precise in a short time. Um, what does theater mean to you? Why do you think it is important in that time we live in, this digital age uh, or second digital age? We have the romantic digital age already behind us, you know, where we thought the little Max 
cubes or whatever would turn us into a better world and the internet would be the paradise of equality or rather equality but now we learn of course it's com controlled by forces that are no longer have the same interest as those who created it so um, in this world we live in what do you think what do you look for what do you think theater should do what does it mean to you um, <clears throat> well um uh... As a consumer of theater, uh, I don't think in terms of importance or not importance. Um, I, I feel that that's a um, kind of pernicious way that we that we approach things that have obvious value, uh, that we have to rank them somehow. Um, and so I, I don't think that theater is important. I don't think theater is not important. I think theater and performance are inevitable. And, uh, and so you, you can live a rich and full life never going to see a show. Uh, it is not something which will, um, you know, improve your lung capacity uh, or feed your children. Uh, so as an art form, I think it is more, it's more, but you can also do the same thing without ever seeing a mountain range, you know, you, a mountain range won't increase your lung capacity either. So you have this, uh, you have a thing which is inevitable, it exists. Um, and what's important is that the attention that we pay to it is the, is the fact that we, um, that it is, uh, that its inevitability gives us something to, to, to look at, to observe, to think about, uh, to enjoy. Uh, to add to the sweetness of life, to make um, burdens lighter. I mean, it, you know, it is it it, it has that value, um, but I, I don't. I think importance is, is sort of too weighty a, a term to put on it. When it comes to what does theater mean um, organizationally, I think that it is a valuable uh, uh, model for a functioning society which is that you have this opportunity to rehearse again and again with a group of people, a, a, um, a, a working group which lives its values, uh, which is what has been so exciting about this summer where values which were not talked about are now being talked about and, and must be dissected and discussed at every level uh, from the artistic directors to the boards, uh, to directors, to actors, to designers, to the people who are, um, who are hauling out the sound equipment. And so I think that it is um, an exciting form because you get to make this little microcosm. You get to say, well, do, is justice possible? Let's just take this one building in New York and see if we can make the life that goes on inside it just. Uh, and that as you work out the practices uh, in those rehearsals, you can actually take them out into the world where citizenship resides. So, you know, I, I think that it is, it also has value in that way, which is that it, it, it is, it allows us to be utopians who are, who are practical. Um, the question of what is essential and what is not essential is, uh, I think, so um, misleading because, as you said at the beginning, we miss it so much and so it feels as though it is essential. But that is not, we don't just miss things that are essential. Um, and and I, I, so I, I, I think I kind of struggle with that um, on social media very much. That's constantly people's rallying and cry is, you know, artists are essential. And I think, well, artists are valuable. Artists are, are uh, mysteries. Artists are miracles. I, I don't know if essential is the right framework for, for this art. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I see that book, an ideal theater, uh, from uh, <laughs> from Todd London, a great book. Yes, <clears throat> I think over ten or fifteen years, he uh, he created manifestos, you know, of theaters who are fo their founding ideas. Um, we actually also, I think, had a single evening about it. What, yes. what What do you think? What would be an ideal theater now in New York if you ran the zoo? Well, one thing. I mean, if I really, you know, if you're giving me power. Yes. 
the first thing I would do, I'm afraid, is that um, the largest theaters would invite the smallest theaters in. Um, one of my, uh, you know, you know the, the awful disease of nostalgia for a time you didn't live in? Well, I have that for the Joseph Papp era. A man, I uh, nope, did not overlap at all. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm having sort of fond memories of a time I didn't experience. However, one of the things that he did at the public, which was part of this great decentralizing project that I think is going to be happening in the art form, but I think should also be happening in the, um, in the administrative structure of how we run theater, is that he would not just say, oh, let us produce this artist's work. He would bring in an entire company and say, I will support you, here is the space, let us, you know, New Federal Theater Project, Woody King Jr., please come into this theater, come and make the work here, because uh, this house is a tent, it is not a building. And I think that kind of the permeable wall is something that I keep hoping for when I look at our, at our larger nonprofits, uh, many of which are, um, have beautiful missions and not always um, not always running with the reddest and freshest blood. And I wonder if they too could make a shelter for theaters that are, um, that are like little organelles that could come and live inside the bigger organization. Um, the Mint Theater, for instance, I don't know, uh, you know, probably the person who runs the Mint is going to send me hate mail for even saying something like this because they absolutely stand on their own two feet and they are strong in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. But when I think about how the Mint Theater and how our signature theater have such similar mission statements, which is recovering the great bounty of the American playwriting tradition, um, how is it that one of them cannot be sheltered or supported by the other? Uh, you know, there are these collisions of mission, which I think when I when I think about how desperate and frightening it's going to be to try to get together the funds to start up again next fall. Um, I just hope that more of these horses stop running alone and more of them start running in harness. Mm. So so for me, that would be what I would what I would do is what I would hope for is is see if that if, if those sorts of hybrid uh, relationships temporary perhaps um, could could begin. Um, yeah, I, you know, I also though think that there is, you see how quickly I stopped talking about the commercial theater because those are pressures that you can bring to bear. Those are proposals you can offer to something like a board or an artistic director. That does not happen on our commercial stages. And I do not actually see a way to link the concerns of commercial theater to non-commercial theater in New York. I, and I wish I did. Um, and I, I know that smarter minds than mine are working on it. Uh, but that is something that is, that would, that's I think would actually create genuine strength, um, genuine uh, progress is if we could work out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that a company like the play company that really produces brilliant international place they have to fight to find a space rented why don't they get a, whatever three play deal you know in in a big space they once every year or two times do whatever you want and uh, and we trust you and um and we, and we have so many when yeah. those things happen they are so mm. productive and exciting mm. think about the relationship between theater for a new audience and soho rep when uh, an yeah. octoroon moved from soho rep yeah. i'm clearly on a brandon jacobs jenkins kick today but i just taught him in class so he's all i'm thinking about but when an octoroon moved from soho rep to theater for a new audience it felt like it felt like the city was a repertory company yeah. And you thought, I see these silver lines stretching from Walker Street down to Brooklyn. Yes, that's what we need. We need, and those citywide networks could also become part of the Northeast Corridor. Uh, so many of the people who are running important regional theaters now, Stephanie Ibarra, uh, Maria Goyanis, and uh, Nataki Garrett, these are people who are, who 
sorry, I get quite excited about this, you know, is, is if there were more collaboration, more participation um, between these more secure organizations with their very deep pocketed boards um, and the, the smaller organizations that are all around them uh, in kind of a satellite relationship, if, if those things could be formalized and stabilized, we might be able to see people getting paid in a way <laughs> that allows them to live and have children. Um, one of the things that we really are missing in our current theater landscape, number one, artists who don't have degrees. We need artists that don't have degrees. We, we should absolutely make it possible to be a thriving artist without an MFA. Not that I don't love education, I teach, but it should be, it should not be the price of admission anymore. And it has become that way in the last 10 years. You know, I, I think there's a, um, anyway, a conversation for another time, but there is, um, I just read this wonderful interview with Susan Laurie Parks in the Paris Review, conducted, you will not be surprised by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, today's theme. And he, she says she remembers being, thinking she was going to become a playwright and looking at the brochure for Yale and thinking to herself, that, it, that is a domesticization of the form. And I think how much beauty and value has come out of Yale, absolutely, take that as read. But our wildness, we have gone through a year of wildness, uh, of, of, of being in the desert. And one thing I hope that we have coming out of it is is a growing interest in refusing that taming impulse, refusing that institutionalizing impulse, um, making it possible for someone to, to come in off the street with a strong play and no recommendations. That's mm. what I want. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And Catania was here uh, on the show and she talked about the time in the 70s or 80s where she kind of was one of the first working dramaturgs and she said the Ford Foundation gave money to create Lincoln Center Theatre, the Guthrie, so many others. And she said there were over <clears throat> 100 playwrights doing really great work and nobody went went to a school, she said, you know, the August Wilsons of the world. Um, and so there's uh, some things too that you also learn. They, she, she said the mentorship that there's an old apprentice Ship model, you know, where you go through stages in your in your work, in it, in the theater, and that's how you learn um, the craft, and um, yeah, or maybe a good symbiosis of both. But as you say, that has that should exist next to each other. When it comes to themes, what would you think? Um, we had here Peter Akersal from that kind of dramaturgical conversation. He said it has to be about the planet, the climate. Uh, Bruno Latour and Frédéric Atuit, Atuit from France, and others who said, you know, this is. This is the big theme. Uh, we are, uh, this is a general rehearsal, COVID. You know, we should not screw that up uh, anyway, but this is nothing compared to what we might be facing on this planet. The entire species is endangered. Um, so, but what do you think? What, what, is, what are themes? What, what do we have to focus on? What would you like to see? So, the issue of the planet is, uh, is I don't know how to say this. Um, theater is not a mass art form. And the, uh, uh, an issue like the climate is something which needs to be addressed in mass art forms because it is going to require mass organization. Do I think that that kind of work comes out of the theater. I honestly don't. I, I don't. I, I, the theater has subtle and um, devious ways into your mind, but it is not great at getting your hand on the voting lever. Um, and the other thing is that a great way to crush artistic spirit is to say, you must write about this or you must write about that. It's so important, how could you not write about it? Uh, so for me, when it comes to content, um, I hope that we see 
you know, things that we don't expect. I mean, I know that I'm not alone in hoping that I do not have to watch a whole bunch of plays about COVID. Mm. I am very, very, very eager not to watch plays about COVID. And I have no doubt that I'm going to watch quite a few. And out of those will come some masterpiece, you know, something, some gorgeous collision of mind and topic. So when I think of what do I hope that the theater deals with, um, another thing that I don't <laughs> like, <laughs> a word I don't really like when we use it around the theater. So one of them is essential and the other one is the word about. What's this play about? What a boring, crappy idea that is. <laughs> I mean, even the word itself acknowledges that it doesn't get to the core of the thing. And theater is wild, naughty, transgressive. Theater is civic. Uh, theater is uh, persuasive, but also coercive. Theater is not a place to write about a thing. And it is a place to engage in a thing. And so I, I think that there is some subtler idea that we will probably see being explored in the theater. Uh, it has something to do with bodies and bodies in presence with each other. Uh, because we must now actually deeply grapple with bodies in presence with each other. What are they capable of doing that we have not been capable of? these last six months. We've been capable of a lot of things these last six months that we didn't think we could do. For instance, making all of the output of the National Theater, for instance, um, accessible to uh, people who cannot leave their homes. That's, that's a major accessibility, radical change, and it's thrilling. So look at the thing we can do when we don't worry about bodies being in presence with each other. But we have also learned about the cost and we are about to confront the incredible mental health care crisis, which we are going to head into after the vaccine, when we realize the cost of this loneliness. And so my hope is that the theater will be, um, will make arguments about, through, for, under, but not about <laughs> um, mm -hmm. embodiment and presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's true in the representation, you know, the body, <clears throat> and then it's represented on screen already often in productions, but now it's just on our screens, you know, I see you, but I see a part of you, it's uh, compartmentalized, and uh, what does it all mean in those uh, performances and productions when we are confronted by, 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 uh, by, by screens? So this is a uh, this is a, a quite a, quite significant what you were saying, and um, and I think it's a lot to uh, really really um, think think through. In your years of watching plays, uh, performances with an open mind and with the, the good idea of the one who's, where you say, I don't know yet, you know what this is about, which is a good thing. So um, of course you know so much, but. Um, what did you learn? What, what do you think? What, is there something you would like, could say to theater artists or young artists who are now listening, perhaps struggling? What should I do? What should I know? What did you learn? What makes, what makes a theater, theater, you, you as a person enjoy? What, is there something where, where you can say, this is what I feel works and that doesn't? Or? Um, so, for some long vanished birthday, um, someone bought me a notebook and wrote in the front of it, Helen's big thoughts about theater. This was meant to basically strong arm me into writing a book. And I was supposed to write down all of my big thoughts about theater and then I would turn these into a book. You will notice that there is no book. And I wrote one thought down in this book <laughs> I managed to have a single big thought about theater. Um, and I had come home from a show and I had written down, I don't know what show it was. And I said, theater is supposed to be a wonder. And um, I think, and I've gone back over that. I 
first of all, I'm appalled that I would write supposed to be because I thought I wasn't very prescriptive, but apparently in the, in the wee hours of the morning, I am prescriptive. And um, what did I mean by wonder? And I, I think that the thing that uh, art does for us, and I don't limit this to theater, uh, but that it overwhelms us, that we are very braced against the world because we are uh, flabby creatures in a stiff wind. And so we are constantly braced against uh, misfortune, other people's ideas, um, correction, embarrassment, uh, all of those things that buffet us and art overwhelms those things. It dissolves us. And I think that if you are dissolved by the thing that you are making, then you are making something that's art, that's theatrical. So I realize that's terribly, terribly vague. Um, but when Lynn manuel Miranda sent his songs off to Stephen Sondheim when he was writing Hamilton. And he said, what advice can you give me? And Sondheim said, surprise us every time. And that I think, and look what he made. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that's the, the, I am a person who only exclusively, all I do is do things with words as a critic. I either say them or write them or read them. And that the reason I'm going to the theater every night, the reason I'm watching something online every night is because I want to see something which I can't describe, which goes beyond the ability of words to capture it. And that's the standard. That's, that's the, um, that should be the baseline. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very strong, uh, strong uh, statement, even so if you say it is weighing this, but I don't, I think it's quite, Quite, uh, quite different. Who, so who, who else, uh, who do you respect uh, as, as critical voices, if you may say, who do you follow also, or who are your mentors or in that world for, you know, for, for, when it comes to theater criticism? Oh, gosh. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I would name everyone I've ever read. I mean, um, you know, right now I'm reading, <laughs> you can see on the shelf behind me everything that I've started and I'm kind of halfway through. So I'm reading Imani Perry and I'm reading Peter Sheldahl and I'm reading Brooks Atkinson's and I'm reading Bart and I'm reading what else is on the top here. So those are the people who are kind of bullying my brain around the block at the moment. Um, you know, uh, other writers who I think are, uh, I will say that the person who got a head start on all of us because her writing has always been interested in breaking down these silos is Soraya McDonald because she writes about opera and theater and sport and film. And I think that that means that she's gone into this period with a mind already flexible enough to handle this massive change in genre that we're all living through. Um, someone else that I, uh, you know, really enjoy reading partially because um, it annoys me very deeply that I'm not as good <laughs> as Vincent Cunningham um, at The New Yorker. Uh, he has a very irritating way of writing perfect sentences. Um, I've been reading, um, Jess Barbagallo has been writing for Art Forum and each of his pieces has been an invitation to a party. You read it and you think, God, what an, not just what an active and brilliant mind coming into collision with some art object or some event or some show or some book in the most recent case, but also if I could think that quickly, what a party he is inviting me to. And that, you know, that's, that's thrilling and activating every time. Um, yeah, I suppose those have been my the three big ones this week. I would say. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. That's great, and you know we come in also a bit to, to, to the end of our talk, and for also our listeners uh, in New York or around uh, through HowlRound in the U.S. or also international listeners, who do you feel who should we pay attention to in the New York 
theater scene? I know it's a big question, an unfair question, but still, uh, you cannot mention everybody, but someone who comes to your mind at the moment, what, who do you think are artists who feel these are ones, you know, watch out for them? Um. All of New York artists, I have to pick one. No, a couple. Of, <laughs> you know what? Oh, what at the moment, you know. So. Um... So, um, I'm a big fan of sort of moving through uh, groups, sort of sideways. So when you figure out writers who are in communication with each other, you often sort of find like the school that they are in. I don't mean their literal school. I mean, the school mm -hmm. of thought. Um, and so I, you know, that seagull I was talking about, one of the delightful things about it was that Celine Song had several of her friends who were also playwrights call in. And it was C.A. Johnson, it was uh, Jeremy O'Harris, it was Alicia Harris uh, and Celine Song and who else? called in. I think there was someone else as well. And, and it was so interesting to hear them in discussion with each other because you realize, ah, of course, their plays are in discussion. Their plays are in communication with each other. And that reading them as a school, just in the same way that you would read a philosophical school, is mm. actually more illuminating than even reading them or watching them one at a time. I am... I, um, the, the shows that I've been fascinated by in shutdown um, have not also always been by people who are young, <laughs> you know? I mean, Adrian Kennedy is still writing and there is a festival on right now, I think, at the McCarter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of, the, one of the other things that this lockdown gives us is a period of study and that what is new, young, and fresh is something that we're all so preoccupied by. Um, but in fact, it is also a chance to listen to, to, to kind of return to the library. Um, you know, what was I watching last night? Shasta Goes Pop was, did something through the shed, which I thought was really gorgeous. Um, uh, I think that's a mind who is sort of really thriving and active. Um, theater in Quarantine, which you of course know about, uh, just did a show through NYU. So I saw it because uh, some of my students were involved and it was dramaturged by Nikki Douglas, who I think is a, is, a, is a maker who was about to have kind of the sort of most smashing year of her life uh, programming wise and then the shutdown happened. Um, but you could see her sort of mischievous intellect working in this production that was um, really quite beautiful. It was a, a riff on every man. Not the Brandon Jacobs Jenkins riff, but a different mm -hmm. one. The so, von Hoffman style version, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I should have no, I should also have more not, names for you. Just something uh, to, to, to uh, find out what <laughs> to look on. No, listen, really, really, um, thank you for um, you know, opening um, um, your mind and being so um, so so courageous. You know, it's very complex, for, of course, also for a theater creator to talk about this about theater companies, artists. It's a very different ball game for you than you know, in a, in a way for us. So really, thank you, and we are, we know we really respect uh, your engagement, your support, and also your love um, for the theater, which I always uh, felt, and this is something that is um, of importance and that sense of the miracle, the wonder, you know, which once in a while comes like in sports you know you watch a lot of games and, uh, and there's a great game but you watch all the you like the sports you know it's all part of it to, to come in there and um, and so help thank you for helping us to you know to understand put it into form and also honor the work you know of um, of the artists which you do um, through your writing so I hope one day there will be a book um, of, uh, of Helen Shaw you should uh, maybe not just your or co or collected works but also I think it is important, you know, to uh, put it perhaps, you know, um, in into uh, context. So I hope one day we will do, we'll see it, and I hope uh, you will be out soon uh, in next year um, without mask and um, and um, and again um, uh, hearing the 
the chatter in the lobby before a play opening, right? How much do we miss that or a celebration afterwards or the discussions about it? But of course, it's a, also a way for us to get together and think about life and what is love and tragedy and what's a stone and what's a tear. So this is how we, what teaches us theater in the moment or what's a, something to, 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 to consider, which is on our mind. And we haven't perhaps quite thought it through and someone else helped us uh, to, to do it. So really, really thank you for taking the time. It's so eloquent how you put it all out there and so, so well, um, well spoken. So really, thank you, thank you. And, um, and uh, maybe we'll continue and have also other voices, you know, from, from your field in our conversations. It is an important contribution that you make to the theater and um, we highly respect it. Um, tomorrow we um, um, have Bertie Ferdman with us, uh, who uh, is a, a teacher also at a university. He was also an actor and, and a director of XP Girls, but uh, now also wrote some books and one of them on, on, on side, as you said, the idea of producing on, on sides to this new idea of um, you know, enjoying and like uh, um, the space you're in and, and really engaging with it. So it will be interesting to see what she will have to say. And, um, and that's it for today. So really, thank you, thank you. And uh, I uh, hope to see you soon in person. And um, uh, all the my best uh, to, to the whole school of thoughts and playwright you're <laughs> reading, looking to, and the Mac Wellman School, of course, you know, is part of that universe. <laughs> And, um, and, and, and so much, so much else. So thank you all. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting um, um, this uh, discussion. And, um, and we will have, you know, next, uh, next week on dramaturgy, we'll have the leaders from LMDA on dramaturgy with us by Leo Gantner will talk to us, Hilary Miller about the New York City when it was the dead city in the 70s or was declared that an art came out again um, out of that kind of, yeah, some of part of it partially ruined. So um, we will continue the conversation. But this was an important uh, reminder and to re reflect on it. So thank you and thanks to our listeners for taking out uh, time. We know how much is out there and, uh, and that we are so busy in this big fatigue of screens and listening. So it means a lot for everyone who uh, takes the time to listen to us. And, um, and thanks to HowlRound for being there, VJ and the great Thea, um, for making this possible. Thank you and to everybody. Bye bye. Stay safe and really do wear masks and... and uh, I hope soon we will be will be over this. Bye bye.